Welcome everyone to this online event on the topic of strategic climate legislation insights from global experience. This event is hosted by the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment here at LSE. And I should mention the event is also being run as part of the London Climate Action Week. My name is Robert Faulkner. I'm the research director of the Grantham Research Institute, and I'll be hosting the event tonight. Shortly, you will hear from an excellent panel of speakers on the question of what role climate litigation plays as a strategic device to drive government's climate policy ambition up to uh, increase the level of commitment that countries make to reducing emissions. We will hear about how climate litigation has spread around the world and how it's become a main element of global climate governance. And we will also discuss the impact that the current COVID-19 crisis has had. And finally, you will hear a brief introduction of a new report that Grantham has just produced on the global state of climate litigation. After the first round of introductory statements from our four panelists, the audience will get a chance to also come in with questions and we will ask the panelists to respond to some of the questions. You will find on your screen a Q&A button which you can use to send us your questions in writing. Please give us your name and your institution and perhaps where in the world you are calling from. We have many hundreds of people from around the world attending this event and it, it will be good to know where you're uh, tuning in from. So please send us your questions uh, all the way through the event and we will then select a few that we will put to the panel. If you want to live tweet about the event, please use the hashtag LSE Climate Litigation and this will then also be available to follow us on Twitter. And finally, I should mention that the event is being recorded and should everything go well with the technical side of, of this, we will produce a podcast of the event, which you can listen to again after it is published on our website. So without much further ado, let me get the panel discussion started. And to do this, I'm going to, first of all, hand over to Michael Berger from Columbia Law School. Mike will chair the actual discussion and direct the panelists, and he will also then manage the uh, uh, Q&A session at the end. Mike is the executive director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law, and he's also a senior research scholar at Columbia Law School. His research and advocacy focuses on legal strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and promote climate change adaptation. Mike is a frequent collaborator with colleagues at the Columbia Earth Institute, and he also works with a lot of local, national and international organizations around this topic. And I should mention, he's also a counsel to the environmental law firm, Scheer Edling. Last but not least, Mike is a good friend and colleague of the Grantham Research Institute, because we have worked for a long time together on our climate change laws of the world database, which also includes, in case you haven't uh, checked it out, a wealth of information on climate litigation around the world. So without much further ado, Mike, I hand over to you and let the session start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. And it's a pleasure to join you here from the other side of the Atlantic uh, in New England, in a, in a town called Gloucester, but not the Gloucester where you are. Um, so this, uh, this, this panel, of course, will be the, the focus of this panel is global climate change litigation. Um, as, as we are all painfully aware, uh, interna the international community is not on a pathway to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in a manner consistent with a two degree global warming scenario, far less a 1.5 degree global warming scenario. And this emissions gap, the gap between what we know needs to be achieved and what we are on course to actually do may also be seen as something of a policy gap. Uh, even as countries are ramping up ambition through their um, nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement, um, the, uh, the, the policies are not being implemented in a way that can achieve the reductions that are necessary on a time scale that's appropriate to the task. One response to this policy gap and this emissions gap is 
an increase in global lit climate litigation around the world. Individuals, communities, non-governmental organizations, corporations, subnational governments, and others are taking to court as a last resort in order to try and increase the ambition and the implementation by governments and the private sector to achieve the necessary climate goals. Now, as we're seeing an increasing number of these types of cases in a growing number of countries all across the world, um, it's a very difficult task to try and provide a adequate survey of what's going on um, and to provide perspectives and insights that can meaningfully weigh in on the status of this, of this trend uh, and, the, and these developments. Nonetheless, with today's panelists, we have uh, a remarkable opportunity to get just that. Um, and without further ado, I'll, I'll get that conversation started. And just as a quick reminder, please do log your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will hear from each of our speakers before we turn to the Q&A and discussion, but I do look forward to pulling from the questions coming in from around the world there um, to get the conversation started. So with that, we'll hear first from Lord Carnwath of Notting Hill. Lord Carnwath was a justice of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom between April 2012 and March 2020. After studying law at Trinity College, Cambridge, Lord Carnwath was called to the bar in 1968 and took silk in 1985. He served as Attorney General to the Prince of Wales from 1988 to 1994. He was a judge of the Chancery Division from 1994 to 2002 and was appointed to the Court of Appeal in 2002. Between 2007 and 2012, he was senior president of tribunals and led the planning and implementation of the reforms of the tribunal system. Lord Carnwath. Thank you, Michael, and hello, everyone. Um, this is slightly strange for me. I retired from the Supreme Court in March um, after 50 years in the law, and I've since then had a rather unexpected period of inactivity. So forgive me if I'm sort of trying to sort of catch up with my legal background. Um, it's, I'm very grateful to be asked to take part in this seminar. Um, I had been planning after my retirement to get very involved in the debate about climate change, particularly in the run up to what would have been the COP26 meeting in Glasgow in um, November this year. Um, and I was particularly keen that we should be um, putting the law, both legislation and litigation, at the center of the discussion, because I think developing a strong legal framework is going to be extraordinarily important over the coming years. And in fact, um, looking back to 2015, I helped to organize a conference in London, an interna international conference on climate change and the law ahead of the Paris Agreement. And I hope we might be able to do something similar next year. In fact, Iram, who I'm delighted to see, came to that conference. He has been very much at the center of work of the Asian Development Bank in promoting judicial training in environmental matters in that part of the world. And so maybe we can persuade her to come back next year. It doesn't need much persuasion to come to London, I don't think. Um, anyway, I wanted to, um, in fact, since then, of course, enormous amount of work has been done, and particularly by uh, the Grantham and the LSE, there's been a, a extended study by Alina Avachenkova and others of um, climate legislation around the world. And Joanna, I think, is going to tell us in a moment about the study on climate litigation around the world. Um, and then James, I think, is going to tell us a bit about the practicalities from the point of view of the litigant, including some aspects of um, civil and company law. But I think it might be helpful for me to look at it for a moment from the perspective of a judge, because um, it's very important for anyone involved in litigation to remember that the judge is human and that you must, litigation must be realistic. Uh, it, it will work best if the judge is offered a realistic form of order that he can make, and that tends to work best when one is working within an established legal framework, preferably legislative, or at least an 
established and settled policy framework. And one can illustrate that by looking at some of the best known cases. I mean, if we go back to the great case of Massachusetts and the EPA in 2007, now that was a landmark case in the sense that the US Supreme Court recognized for the first time the reality of the threat of climate change. But in one sense, it was a narrow exercise in, um, in statutory construction of the Clean Air Act. Um, in legal terms, the order simply required the Environmental Protection Agency to give effect to the act. Once it was established that greenhouse gases were within the scope of the act, then the rest followed under the clear and mandatory framework established by the act. Now, it's true that it took a change of government and a new, uh, the Obama administration ready to put that into practice. But the statutory endangerment finding by the, um, the EPA was done under the act and that in due course led to the Obama's strong climate change policies and his leadership of efforts, successful efforts to get a, um, an agreement in Paris. Now, in 2015, in, in advance of our conference, there had in fact been two very important um, cases, again, very well known. We'd had the agenda case at first instance in the Netherlands and the Leghari case in Pakistan. Um, and as you know, in both cases, the national courts have held challenges to government's failure to take action on climate change. And we were lucky enough to have judges from both courts at our conference in 2015 who discussed with us the sort of their perspective on the cases. Now, the agenda case was, of course, of enormous symbolic importance at the time because it was the first such case, successful case in Europe. And it had, and others have followed. Um, but it actually turned at that stage on a relatively narrow point of Dutch tort law, which is of no great significance. And in fact, also the um, appeal process uh, took some four years. It was only last year that we had the very important decision of the, um, the Supreme Court in the Netherlands which upheld the decision, but on broader grounds under the Human Rights Convention. Now, fortunately, the Dutch government had accepted the spirit of the decision, although they appealed on the legal aspect. So it didn't matter that it didn't have any immediate coercive effect. The um, Pakistani case was much more effective in the short term. The um, judge, Mansour Ali Shah, who is now in the Supreme Court, but then in the Lahore High Court, came to our conference and told us uh, with some glee how he had managed to devise a, a novel form of order, which involved setting up a sort of non-statutory climate change commission under the control of the court. <clears throat> and that was under the chairmanship of a very distinguished um, Pakistan environmental lawyer, Dr. Public Hassan, and it brought together all the interested bodies. And it worked very effectively. Uh, and it worked, I think, an important reason being that the government didn't appeal, they cooperated, and it was working with the government policies. Basically, it was helping the government to give effect to their own policy framework. Now, um, one can contrast perhaps the experience of the Juliana case in the USA. Now, um, you'll recall that it was in autumn 2016 that Judge Aiken in the US District Court in Oregon produced a remarkable decision, which basically refused to strike out the action by young citizens against the government um, for failing its constitutional duty um, to protect them against consequences of climate change. Now, that almost coincided, of course, with the election of Donald Trump in November 2016, followed by his announcement in 2017 that the um, US would withdraw from the Paris Agreement. 
and his reversal of most of the Obama climate change policy. Now, um, there had been no, um, there was no attempt, as far as I know, to justify this dramatic reversal of policy by reference to any scientific evidence. But had there been a scientific basis for it, um, the Juliana case might have been a good opportunity for the new administration to set out its store in an independent judicial forum. The, um, now, as you know, after Judge Aitken's ruling, the exchange of, and the exchange of pleadings, the case became embroiled in procedural wrangling, and it eventually found its way to the uh, Court of Appeals from the Ninth Circuit, who gave their decision earlier this year, dismissing the claim. But what is, I think, very important to note is that both the majority as well as and the minority acknowledge the um, evidence. There was no real challenge to the evidence that the, uh, as Judge Hurwitz put it, that the federal government has long promoted fossil fuel use despite knowing that it can cause catastrophic climate change. And that failure to change existing policy may hasten an environmental apocalypse. So that's the majority. But they wouldn't felt they couldn't do anything about it. And their reasons were nothing to do with the merits, but all to do with practicality and procedure. And uh, as he said, there's much to recommend the adoption of a comprehensive scheme to decrease fossil fuel emissions and combat climate change, both as a policy matter and a matter of national survival. Um, but as the, it is beyond the power of an Article Three court to order, design, supervise, or implement the plaintiff's requested remedial plan. And as he said, it would require a host of complex policy decisions entrusted for better or worse to the wisdom and discretion of the executive and legislative branches. And he said that the plaintiff's quote, impressive case for redress must be referred to the um, political branches of the government even though, as he acknowledged, he said that the other branches may have abdicated their responsibility, does not confer any power on the court to step into those shoes. Now, that is depressing reading, but and one hopes that other courts might have found some way to remedy the position. But it does point the fact that it's so much easier to do that when one has a clear legislative structure. And I can see, I mean, I, I haven't got time to talk about the Cloud Earth case, which we had in the Supreme Court here on air pollution, where we ordered the government to produce a plan, but that was within the framework of the um, European legislation. And I think also our own Climate Change Act, if and when there's a, there were, may well be a dispute between the Climate Change Committee and the government about what needs to be done, the courts may find themselves stepping into that but within a clear framework. And so to my mind, one of the very important things we want to look at over the coming year is how legislation and litigation can work together to provide an effective framework. So thank you all very much. And I look forward to the contributions of the others. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Lord Carnwath, for that uh, concise and insightful recitation of some of the key cases uh, that we have seen in courts uh, in, in Europe, Pakistan, and the United States. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about the client earth cases from, from James in a bit. Um, next, we will hear from Joanna Setzer. Joanna is an assistant professorial research fellow at the Grantham Research Institute on climate change and the environment at LSE. After studying law at the University of Sao Paulo, she worked for eight years as an environmental lawyer in Brazil. She then moved on to academia, obtaining a master and a, P and a PhD from LSE. And since 2013, she has been involved in the Grantham Research Institute's Climate Change Laws of the World Project. And it's been my great pleasure to work with Joanna for a number of years on uh, these and, and related projects. Uh, and she'll be presenting a, a new report on global climate change litigation. Joanna? You are muted. Sorry, the computer did it by itself. Let me share my screen with you. Um, just a second.
Ah, it's saying it's failing to share to start the uh, sharing of the screen. Maybe there's some something that the teams can do. But I'm happy to start without the the PowerPoint and uh, and try again later because we are short of time. So um, as we um, as you know, we are today publishing our new updated climate uh, change litigations report. And uh, this is a work that Rebecca Burns and I did together. And um, it's uh, already available on Grantham's website. I encourage all of you to download it and read it. Um, let's see if it's working now. I think they gave me permission. Do I have permission to share? No, I still don't have permission to share. So I will do uh, without the PowerPoint. There are some good graphs there, but you can look at uh, in the actual report. So um, this is uh, a work that we do every year now. And what we aim is to provide a synthesis of key developments in climate litigation around the world over the year, this time between May 2019 and May 2020. The report and this presentation are divided into three parts. So first, I will give you an update of the assessment of known case numbers. Second, I will explore the growing focus on human rights and the different strategies used in, the recent, in recent litigation against major fossil fuel companies. And thirdly, I will discuss the impacts of climate litigation. Um, well, so you would now see a map with uh, the total cases that we've known of. Uh, there are currently 1,587 cases in, uh, across all six continents. So these cases were brought between 1986 and uh, end of May 2020, the vast majority in the US, 1,214 there, and 374 other cases in 36 countries and eight regional or international jurisdictions. Outside the US, the majority of cases have been brought in Australia, the UK, and EU bodies and courts. But cases raising issues of law or fact regarding climate change are increasingly reaching courts everywhere. Uh, the database contains, for example, 37 cases of climate litigation in the global south, more than half brought in the past five years. Our main source of data is the Climate Change Laws of the World database, which is an open access searchable database maintained by the Grantham at NSE. And this is a joint initiative with the Sabin Center of, at Columbia. A separate US and also non-US litigation database is maintained by the Sabin Center. Um, I, I would now show you a graph. Uh, and uh, this graph is a very clear, uh, shows very clearly how litigation is increasing. So you see that the majority of recorded cases occurred after 2007. Shall I try again to share my screen? Let me try a last time. No, it says I can't. Anyway. So um, what we see is that the failure of um, COP, uh, COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009 reignited an interest in climate litigation as a governance strategy. Uh, the following years after the Paris Agreement in 2015 have also seen an increase in climate related cases. So in the, the graph, you, you, you see it, there's a, a spike in 2015. So for our report, what we did, we classified uh, the, the cases in a few ways. One of the ways we did was we classified on whether climate change was central or peripheral to the case. Uh, we see that climate is at the center of the legal argument in about 41% of cases. And it is peripheral uh, to the case in the remaining 59%. Uh, so this means that there is uh, an explicit reference to climate change, but litigants rely mostly on other different grounds. Um, we observe also that cases, as Mike said, are brought by a variety of plaintiffs. And to the list that he, he's mentioned, I also would add political parties, as we just saw uh, this month, political parties in Brazil bringing cases against the government. Uh, we have a figure that maps uh, cases outside the US since 1994, and we see that almost 75% of cases have been brought against governments, typically by corporations or individuals. And, and in the US, we see similar figures. I also think it is important to highlight that the term climate litigation covers a wide variety of cases. So some are really designed to reach outcomes that go beyond that individual litigant bringing the case. 
And these cases have been brought also as a way to create awareness and encourage public debate. They are sometimes called uh, strategic litigation. But climate litigation also includes a number of other civil and administrative procedures brought in the pursuit of private interests, which might not involve uh, activist intent and yet can be also very important. So our database also tracks climate legislation around the world. And we have almost 1,900 laws and policies in 198 jurisdictions that we know of. And, and what we try to do is to see if there's a relationship between legislation and litigation. And, and this is still unclear. The number of climate laws not necessarily indicate the number of climate lawsuits. So take the US, for example. The US doesn't have a dedicated climate law, and yet the, uh, they, they have a, a huge number of lawsuits uh, dealing with climate that are bought, brought under general environmental acts or other types of legislation. In contrast, Brazil has 28 climate laws, including a very specific and wide national climate act. And yet up to May 2020, only two cases were predominantly grounded in this legislation. In our report, we also analyzed whether the outcome of the cases was favorable or unfavorable to climate action. Outside the US, judges appear to be more inclined to support climate action. So we find that 58% of cases had outcomes that were favorable to climate action, against 33% that were unfavorable and 9% that had no discernible likely impact on climate policy. This result seems to be slightly higher, so more favorable than uh, results done in previous analysis of climate litigation in the US. I go now to the second part of the report where we look at three themes and strategies. So the first theme of 2019 is climate activism. As you might remember 2019, um, that was a year of intense protesting. So for example, only here in the UK, over 2,800 people were arrested over two periods of mass protests in April and October, 2019. We observed that litigation and direct protests were blended, forming part of this broader strategy of environmental and climate advocacy. Public order offenses leading to arrest and prosecution were encouraged as an extreme form of our climate activism. Protesters were also advised to present some particular messaging in their statements with the ultimate aim of influencing how courts address climate change more broadly. The second theme is the continued focus on human rights. So human rights have been important in a number of new climate cases and also decisions over the past year. Over between 2015 and now, we know of 40 cases that were brought against states and corporations for human rights violations related to climate change, 14 of which in the past year. So in the report, we emphasize the use of human rights as a basis for three types of cases. First, cases that oblige states to reduce their emissions. And of course, we will think about the ultimate success of Agenda in uh, December 2019, which provided an even greater impetus for these cases. Second, uh, cases that inv involve climate refugees. So in the Tetiota case, a citizen from Kiribati affected by climate change was seeking asylum in New Zealand. The UN Human Rights Committee did not decide in his favor, but it found that states have an obligation to protect the right of life, opening a potential pathway to future cases. Um, we also see cases brought by young people who represent current and future generations. And as Lord Carnot mentioned in the Juliana case, the US Court of Appeals dismissed the claim on the basis that the subject matter was unsuitable for judicial determination. But as he, he, he also mentioned, the majority uh, judgment recognized that the, U the US government contributes to climate change, not only through inaction, but also by affirmatively promoting fossil fuel use. The third theme is litigation against fossil fuel companies. And, and we see uh, in the report, we mapped uh, that in the past, since 2015, we know of 40 ongoing climate uh, cases worldwide against carbon majors, 33 of which in the US. These cases have been filed on a variety of grounds and uh, you can see they're becoming more and more creative. So there were the initial cases, liability suits seeking for damages, which we still see, but we also see claims that 
companies have defrauded shareholders and misinterpreted the impacts of climate change. We see now more recently, and Client Earth has an example of greenwashing claims. We see claims related to the inadequate environmental assessment of projects and claims dealing with the violation of human rights obligations. The last part of the report, part three, we explore some of the direct and indirect impacts of climate litigation. So we know there's a handful of successful landmark cases against governments, and these indicate that the type of pro-regulatory impacts uh, can result from climate litigation. So again, back to agenda, after the final ruling, the Dutch government committed to reduce the capacity of its remaining, remaining coal-fired power stations and implement a 3 billion euros package to measures to reduce emissions in the Netherlands. We also see that even cases that are lost in courts, sometimes litigants also claim success, even if, if it is by building a narrative or in a strong dissenting judgment decision, such as Juliana. But litigation also implies risks, and we, we emphasize that these can be also economic costs involved. There are also the indirect uh, impacts from litigation, and in, in our report, we, we discuss a bit the potential impacts on market valuation. For that, uh, a specific methodology called event studies could be used to assess whether climate litigation has any impact on stock prices of plaintiff companies. So my last point, and I only need half a minute to finish, is that it regards the impact of COVID-19 on climate litigation. So it is possible that COVID-19 will lead to a decrease in new filings and a slower pace in the determination of ongoing litigation. But it is also possible that COVID-19 will motivate litigants to find new grounds for, for bringing cases. For example, linking the current health emergency to the climate emergency. The argument is already being made that, the reco that recovery packages should focus on low carbon work programs. Then there's also growing concern that governments are bailing out the oil, airline and car, car industries and that the pandemic is being used to roll back environmental regulations. In this regard, litigation could have an important role in preventing increased emissions and, and the further erosion of the environmental rule of law. So this is in a nutshell what the report uh, is covering. Apologies for the lack of slides. You can see everything in the report and I'm looking forward to Q and A's. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Um, next we'll hear from James Thornton. James is the founding CEO of Client Earth. After graduating from Yale, James worked many years as an environmental lawyer and social entrepreneur, a member of the bars of New York, California, and the Supreme Court of the United States, and a solicitor of England and Wales, James launched Client Earth in 2007, sparking fundamental change in the way environmental protections are made and enforced across Europe. Now operating globally, Client Earth uses advocacy, litigation, and research to address nature loss and climate change. James? Thank you, Mike, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, what, what a great day when uh, we can sit at home and discuss uh, climate change uh, litigation uh, with, uh, <clears throat> with an enthusiastic uh, crowd. Uh, I wanna share with you, uh, uh, to give you a sense of the richness of the possibilities of climate change litigation, I want to quickly draw uh, eight different types of, um, of basis of climate change litigation and types of litigation for you uh, from, from our experience. And then of course, uh, we can discuss more in questions. So um, we've had a high volume of cases uh, ourselves uh, and uh, uh, one of the uh, biggest areas for us has been anti-coal. Uh, when I started uh, Client Earth, the, one of the chief ambitions back when we had only four people, we now have 200, uh, was to stop all the new coal fired power stations uh, that were intended to be built in Europe. And we've been quite successful at that. Uh, we've stopped, we've killed just 36 plants by my current um, uh, estimation. Uh, we're looking to close all of the existing plants. There are interesting strategies on that. Uh, and uh, we, by uh, winning two cases in Greece against the wonderfully named uh, Megalopolis 1 and Megalopolis 2 uh, power stations, 
uh, uh, Greece uh, decided it was going to end uh, all of its uh, generation from coal by 2028, uh, becoming a leading European uh, uh, country in that regard. Next for coal is Asia. Uh, we're turning to Asia, uh, and there are over 400 coal-fired power stations that are uh, planned to be built there. Uh, we'll work uh, with partners throughout the region to try and prevent as many of those from being built as possible using a variety of legal strategies. And I mentioned partners, and all of the work we do um, is done with partners. Uh, we rarely bring a case on our own. Uh, we work with partners uh, throughout the world. Second type of case is air quality. Uh, Robert uh, Carnworth, Lord Carnworth, uh, wrote the great opinion uh, in the case that we uh, brought on air quality in, in the UK, uh, in which uh, the Supreme Court gave its first uh, uh, environmental injunction. And then we, we quickly deployed uh, the theory across Europe, uh, and we've now had clean air litigation in something like uh, 20 countries. Why is it uh, also climate litigation? Uh, well, we're attacking diesel, uh, and diesel particles are hyperpollutant, but also the idea is to move the um, uh, move the market away from diesel, away from petrol, and towards electric. And we've seen diesel sales fall in Germany since we won cases in uh, Stuttgart, Dusseldorf, and Munich by more than 20%. Uh, and the industry is saying that, uh, that we're actually helping move the market towards electric. So I like to think we're going to save BMW in the end uh, by moving it uh, into being an electric company much more quickly than it otherwise would have been. Third area is uh, uh, state aid law. So uh, um, John was mentioning the uh, uh, state aid that will be coming uh, after COVID. We're going to be looking very, very carefully to see if state aid uh, is actually uh, legally done uh, in a challenging where it is not. But a couple of interesting state aid cases, uh, we in pre-litigation proceedings uh, went against uh, ETS, so emissions trading scheme uh, permits uh, for 7 billion euros worth uh, in Poland and convinced the uh, EU not to give them. And we recently sued the European Investment Bank, uh, which was uh, uh, is, is a good outing, I think. Um, and uh, that was for subsidizing illegally, we think, a, a biomass uh, plant in Spain. Now, a fourth and different area uh, is competition law. So um, uh, all of the laws that have to do with uh, the movement uh, of financial assets uh, are uh, ripe, I think, for use in climate change litigation. So we've built a team of 12 lawyers uh, who are experts in different areas of uh, all of the laws regarding finance company law, securities law, pensions law, uh, and, uh, and so on, uh, banking law, insurance law. Now, competition law is another one. And um, we had a very interesting case. The partner here was uh, a company, uh, and we wanted to challenge the UK capacity market mechanism, technical, but it's a uh, 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 way the energy market is kept open. Uh, the idea is you have as a European country a certain amount of energy always in the system. That's what this mechanism is designed to do. But we thought the UK uh, was using it to subsidize fossil fuels. We found a company partner, uh, designed the case, made the case happen, and won uh, in, in the European courts. So we had the UK capacity market mechanism suspended. Uh, and that sent a big ripple through the um, uh, all of the energy markets of the EU and made countries think again about how to design their capacity market mechanism. And the arena of competition law uh, as well, um, we recently sued um, EDF, uh, Electricity de France, uh, the monopolist uh, uh, energy uh, company in, in France. Uh, and that was not because they rely on coal, they don't, they rely on nuclear, which from an emissions point of view is good. However, they use their monopoly power uh, to prevent community energy systems which are very good uh, from a climate change perspective uh, for renewable energy uh, from coming online. So uh, we joined uh, in a suit uh, to try and break the monopoly uh, of uh, EDF. Uh, it's essentially suing France, so it'll be interesting to see what the French courts uh, do, do with that. Moving to the human rights dimension, um, uh, we brought a case on behalf of Torres Strait Islanders who are within the jurisdiction of Australia uh, against Australia um, in the uh, UN Human Rights uh, Committee, uh, arguing uh, human rights and uh, arguing in an agenda kind of way, but before the Supreme Court ruling an agenda, uh, that there was a human rights uh, reason uh, that compelled the Australia uh, to both lower its emissions, come up with a plan to lower its emissions, and uh, pay compensation for the damage uh, to, the, to the islanders. 
And we did that because uh, the, the Australian courts themselves uh, did not seem like they were going to be a friendly forum for uh, an agenda style case. And we thought the, uh, given the facts of this case, um, the Human Rights Commission uh, was likely a friendly forum. So we'll see where that goes. Another arena um, is challenging gas. You know, we usually think of challenging coal uh, or, or transportation, but uh, the world uh, shouldn't move uh, to gas uh, in a very big way. And we've, we've been challenging large gas infrastructure projects. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline uh, is a, a vast infrastructure project to bring Russian gas to Europe. So we, bring, uh, we brought it, uh, a series of uh, six claims uh, in six countries uh, against the pipeline, uh, countries that it was going to move through. Those were not successful. We've also brought a case recently against uh, what would be the largest gas-fired power station in Europe, uh, Drax in the UK. And at the first instance, uh, we, were, we were not successful there. But challenging gas, I think, uh, becomes an important uh, thing to be doing. Uh, we wrote a letter advising the European Investment Bank when it was considering whether it would uh, fund uh, green field gas projects that they would be um, violating their obligation as a European entity under the Paris Agreement were they to go ahead with such financing. And I'm happy to say they decided against it. Uh, <clears throat> greenwashing was mentioned and we brought a case against BP for a false advertising campaign, uh, a complaint to the OECD. Uh, and uh, BP withdrew its advertising campaign, but happily the OECD uh, gave us a judgment in any case, which will be helpful in, in future cases. Uh, and then company law. And let me end with company law and a story. So um, the, um, the question I had was, how do you uh, go beyond using environmental law? We all know as environmental lawyers, those of us who are, how to use environmental law quite effectively against coal-fired power stations and so on. Uh, but I've been giving you examples of going beyond environmental law uh, to use particularly the laws uh, relating to commerce and finance, uh, to try and move markets uh, and move investment uh, in a major way away from fossil fuel and towards renewable energy, to make the world safe for renewable energy, but also to force investment uh, to consider the risks of climate change. We've been arguing in a, very, uh, in a very pleasant sort of way about fiduciary duty for five years now to pension funds, uh, to officers and directors of companies. But we decided uh, it, we needed to get a bit tougher. So um, uh, there was a, a new coal-fired power station to be built in Poland. And the Polish government was the majority shareholder of the utility, which is called the NIA. Um, and um, it was calling uh, this the uh, last new coal-fired power station in Europe, which I took to be a kind of backhanded compliment to all, uh, our success in stopping all these other Polish uh, 30 uh, coal-fired power stations. Anyway, we had a, an economic study done by Carbon Tracker. The reason for that is the very good news, since I was a young environmental lawyer working on all this stuff, is that the market has moved in favor of, of green energy and green everything, indeed. The Oxford Smith School just came out with a very beautiful study showing that uh, 230 economists around the world um, all agreed uh, that green investment was the quickest and highest returning investment for a post-corona stimulus. Anyway, so we did this, uh, econ had this economic study done about the new coal-fired power station in Poland that Ania wanted to build, which showed that it would not make a profit. We took that to the company. They insisted on going ahead anyway. And uh, that allowed us uh, to move ahead with our plan of buying shares, becoming shareholders. And in the world's first case of this type, we then sued the company uh, when it went ahead to build the coal-fired power station. Now, the part I like about this the best is this is not an environmental claim of any sort. This was a pure company law claim. We said, uh, we're shareholders and you are violating your ordinary standard duty of care to us as shareholders. Now, in order to make the point clearly, we sued the officers and directors personally um, under the theory that it would get their attention between three and five o'clock in the morning. Now, uh, we, I think, succeeded in getting their attention and we hired the best securities litigator in Poland to bring the case and we won the case. Now, winning the case uh, was after all of the, the Polish 
press wrote about the case as a pure business case. The extreme right-wing business paper, Resh Popolita, didn't treat it as a case by crazy environmentalists against a company. They said, the time has come in Poland when investors are questioning whether coal is a good investment or whether it'll be a stranded asset. So our claim was essentially, we've invested 30 euros in your company. You're going to ruin our investment and you must act better. We won and then the real punchline is the next day, the share price of Ania went up 4%. So the market agreed. Uh, and that was a beautiful uh, moment and gave us great hope. And of course, a great many ideas for future uh, litigation um, against companies, against banks, against central banks, and all kinds of things that we can discuss later. But I realize that my time has come. And I, I hope what I've been able to do is share the flavor of uh, the many different possibilities that um, uh, different types of, of law and different types of legal structures give for creative use for climate change litigation. So thanks. Thank you, James, for that overview of the remarkable array of strategies and tactics that Client Earth is deploying to address the climate crisis across Europe. Next, we'll hear from Irum Asan. Irum is principal counsel in law and policy at the Asian Development Bank uh, in their legal department. She completed her legal education at the LSE and is licensed to practice law in the high courts of Pakistan. Her work includes strengthening environmental and climate change adjudication and enforcement with the higher judiciaries of South Asia. She is also an advocate for gender consciousness and for women's rights. Irum? Hi, thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. And thank you, GRI, to invite me uh, tonight. And uh, it's, it's afternoon there. Uh, and with me, I bring my very bad Pakistani English accent. So please bear with me. But with me also, I bring pure Asian Pacific perspectives to today's uh, conversation. So let me start the, my, my talk by stating why Asia and Pacific as a region is important. And I, I tend to talk a lot about Asia Pacific because it kind of gets lost in a lot of conversations. In 2015, Asia and Pacific contributed to CO2 emissions as, 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 as high as 40% as compared to 60% of the rest of the world. Seven out of 10 countries that are high disaster risk uh, prone countries are from Asia and Pacific. And, um, and, and then from 1989 to 2018, 5.2 billion people have been affected in Asia Pacific from climate induced disasters. Uh, I come from a bank, so I love to throw numbers and stats. Um, uh, Joanna's was based on research, mine is ADP stats that I often use. Um, now, why? What, what, what as an international or multilateral development bank like us are doing about it, uh, having the head office in Asia and working for Asia and Pacific? We decided to work with the legal stakeholders, particularly judicial stakeholders in Asia and Pacific. And why that? Because normally institutions like us work with environmental ministries, executive bodies, but we decided to work with judges because of a few very significant reasons. Number one, weak environmental governance in Asia and Pacific. Institutions in these countries like enforcement institutions, EPA, uh, ministries, legislative bodies are not very effective. Hence, as um, uh, uh, I think Mike initially said that uh, courts are last resort. In Asia Pacific courts, unfortunately, is not, are not last resort, but they're the first resort to get constitutional rights implemented quickly and more effectively. And secondly, um, you know, judges have been very, very uh, fo focused and um, strategically leading litigation in Asia and Pacific. Hence, we see a lot of reforms done through courts and, uh, and, and these judges. But these are those judges who are extremely powerful, but when they were becoming lawyers, they didn't even study environmental law as a subject. So what was needed was to, in, in, to equip these judges with legal tools, with, uh, with uh, resources, with training, with guidance, and that's where we come in. And we tried, I think it's been two decades now that we've been working with the judges in Asia and Pacific and Lord Kanwath has been witnessing as an observer from UK and some other jurisdiction judges part participate. 
and they have been talking about jurisprudence coming out of uh, Asia and Pacific. So as a last phase of this this project and new projects are coming in, of course, the work has not ended. We decided to actually, um, you know, compile our work into series of reports, the litigation that is coming out of Asia Pacific, which, which speakers before me have talked about. So we are producing four report series um, and the title is Climate Change Coming to a Court Near You Very Soon. Um, and, and then we have four uh, reports. The first report is talking about the introduction of the series plus the climate science. Now we all know that climate science portrays a very, very grim pic picture unless and until we actually use it into action. Now that action can be brought by judges very well. Judges can play a vital role in making findings of facts based on this climate science. Secondly, judges can actually remind governments and, and uh, civil societies about their ethical and moral uh, obligation while working on uh, uh, these factual and climate sci science uh, issues. And most importantly, judges have the ability to scuttle um, the unsettled and unsupported uh, climate denial rhetoric. So hence, you know, climate science and judges, we are kind of linking this in the first report. The second report talks about climate litigation. As Joanna mentioned that climate litigation so far has been seen in which climate change has been raised as an issue, uh, either a central or peripheral issue. We have expanded this definition of climate litigation for Asia Pacific. We also consider climate litigation to be a litigation that is not raising climate change as a main issue, but talking about important uh, principles that are useful for mitigation and adaptation. Secondly, we have gathered cases from the entire Asia and Pacific, so plethora of information. What we have done, we sifted through those cases, and then we analyzed and compared it uh, with the litigation coming from the rest of the world. We are trying to make a case that climate change is impacting each and every aspect of the society, but disproportionately and unjustly. So to able to bring climate justice, judges have to actually look into each and every case that comes uh, before them with the climate lens on. And we have been training judges and lawyers, uh, and we have some champion judges and brilliant uh, jurisprudence coming out of these judges as well. Uh, this is important because he, who knew, like Dr. Lord Kanwat mentioned, the Lagari case from Pakistan, who knew that a farmer's case pleading for water for his farms can actually result into implementation of climate policy in a country. So that's the strategic litigation coming out of Asia. In the litigation paper, we have divided into categories like uh, cases uh, holding governments accountable against the private sector, permitting in judicial review cases, adaptation cases, cases on vulnerable people. So it's easy to navigate through the report. The third and fourth reports talk about national legal uh, frameworks and international legal frameworks. Now these frameworks are available in various places. We just wanted to provide one stop shop for our judges and legal stakeholders and in a very readable manner. So these legal and judicial frameworks pertain to all aspects of climate change, be it energy, water, agriculture, name it, and we've gathered that. And also in a tabular form we presented. So if a judge wants to know that this particular treaty um, has uh, been ratified by which country, so in one table, they'll say, okay, this treaty ratified by this country, not ratified by this country. So in a glance, they can, you know, read it in an effective manner. So that was the third and fourth report. Now, let me talk about, everyone is talking about strategic litigation coming out, and I've already seen there are 57 questions posted, a lot to do with, um, you know, I've been sifting through these questions as well. Litigation is actually very strategic in Asia and Pacific. And I think activist lawyers and civil society organizations are intentionally uh, 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 making these uh, cases in the courts. Because as I said, legislative action is slow. Institutions are slow in these countries. So a lot of reforms are brought in uh, due, uh, uh, because of this litigation. If you do not strategize litigation, we also see missed opportunities here. So I will give you an example of uh, one case, uh, how it was a missed opportunity. It is still sub, -ju sub judice, so let's see, maybe something comes out. Um, I, let me give you uh, some flavor of a few cases. Um, in Nepal, uh, 2018, Mr. Shrestha challenged, uh, uh, filed a petition against the government saying that climate change is an existential threat and it is violating the constitutional rights of dignity, health, environment, safety, protection, food, et cetera. And lack of climate legislation and lack of implementation of climate policy is exasperating this threat. 
the government agreed with the petitioner, the Supreme Court, I'm sorry, agreed with the petitioner and directed the government to immediately legislate on climate change law. And till that is done, implement the climate change policy. So, you know, one, one petition actually uh, translated into this legislative reform. Uh, this, this, this case was a patent after the Lahari case from, uh, from Pakistan as well. Um, in another case, uh, in Simkhada case in Nepal as well, Justice Bhattarai, who's one of our champion judges, went beyond constitution and national laws and stated that government of Nepal, in this case, uh, the government allowed construction of a road through Chitwan National Park, which was a UNESCO heritage, heritage site as well. The judge said it's not only constitution and national laws, government of Nepal has also signed Paris Agreement and several other treaties. So what about international obligations? So it went beyond national laws. <coughs> Let me steer the conversation and this is very close to my heart. I always try to bring this technical and scientific conversation towards people centric. We do not, uh, we have to be very careful that we do not ignore people and human angle to the climate debate. Uh, so I want to, in this report series, we also want to remind people to mind the gap between climate change and vulnerable people. Again, some numbers. Um, when it comes to children, nearly 160 million people live in, children live in the high drought um, uh, severity zones, according to UNICEF. When we talk about elderly people in the vulnerable group, 56% deaths in Japan tsunami were age 65 or over. When we talk about differently abled people within the vulnerable group, 20% are people with differently abled um, uh, capabilities. Let's talk about women then. 77% of the fatalities again in the Japan tsunami, tsunami were women and girls. And you know why? Because simply they did not know how to swim. So th this is the disproportionate impact of uh, climate change on, on vulnerable groups. Uh, so we need to uh, discuss this and we all know that climate change is unjust. It is disproportionately affecting people. So, you know, rising sea levels might mean totally different to a posh gated community living in Dasmarania's village in Manila versus people living in the sinking Vanuatu Island. Um, in I talked about missed opportunities. Let me uh, talk about Maria Khan case from Pakistan, which was filed in, I think, 2019. Uh, in, where five women took the case to Lahore High Court stating that government is not doing anything in emission reduction in the energy sector and that these emissions are disproportionately impacting women. They made beautiful case linking climate change uh, impacts for women. The missed opportunity here was that at the end, they did not ask for any relief relating to women. We all jumped from our seats at war of women rights cases coming out of Pakistan. We have beautiful chapter to write in our reports, but hey, that was a missed opportunity versus what happened in the Philippines case of Aposa uh, versus Spectran, where Tony Aposa took the case on behalf of unborn children. And I saw some questions regarding unborn children and children as well. And I thought I include this, uh, uh, sorry, Mike included this at the last minute, where Tony Aposa asked government to cancel timber licenses because he said, if you cut trees, mindlessly and blindly, you are robbing future generations uh, to the right of forest, right to forest. So government actually agreed to this claim and how well he linked uh, disproportionate impacts on children of climate change, even on unborn children. This case was relied upon in the Juliana case as well, but unfortunately that case did not result into the success that we saw in, in uh, but you know, he used very well and then relief was directly linked to children, unlike Maria Khan case. A beautiful case from Bangladesh on vulnerable people, again, in, on, on women. In 2012, uh, Bella as an organization went to court challenging the um, commercial shrimp farming in Sundarbans uh, of Bangladesh. A uh, government was clearing massively mangroves to allow the commercial shrimp farming, hence reducing, um, shrinking the agriculture land, polluting and contaminating drinking water and affecting biodiversity. Bella uh, uh, used disproportionate impacts on, clan, on, on women as well. And court beautifully said that this means that uh, by contaminating water and reducing agriculture land, it would not just mean that women will have to walk thousands of extra miles to collect drinking water, but also have to invest more time to, to bring in, uh, uh, you know, agriculture produced uh, home and, and wasting, you know, education rights of the girls and, and women. So very nicely done by the judge. Similarly, in um, Gaurav Kumar case from India, it was a disaster risk planning case. 
but the judge observed that while government of india is planning for disaster management they need to make sure that the rights of widows and orphans are taken care of you know so it's just the judge with a climate lens who understands these sensibilities uh, talking about it and um, uh, i think uh, let me stop here because i see mike's warning as well um, that's all from the asia and pacific pacific hope you understood my accent i know it's terrible but thank you mike and thank you elsi once again well, thank you so much iram i think i i understood every word and that's uh, it's it's a remarkable opportunity for all of us to um get more exposure to how climate litigation is playing out in the asia pacific region um we have a lot of questions <laughs> that have been coming in throughout uh the course of the presentations and um rather than exercise my prerogative to ask a first question of my own i'm just going to dive right in because there are some great questions coming in um i'm going to identify a panelist um or identify a number of panelists to respond to specific questions and ask that you try to make your answers brief and to the point um to see if we can fit in as many as we can over the next 30 minutes or so or 27 minutes that we have remaining lord carnwath first question goes to you following the urgenda success how and when will legal powers hold the uk government and companies in the uk to account to comply with human rights obligations and to the commitments of the paris agreement That's a big question um and as a judge I'm probably not the right person to answer it because it depends on someone like James or client of bringing a case um I mean I I think you I mean my perspective was actually that in in this country we have a very strong legislative framework in the climate change act one of my points was that one needs to look to legislative framework and if one has that sort of framework then it's that's going to be the focus of litigation rather i think than the broader um constitutional or human rights or the perspective um as far as government is concerned and i you know it's uh, if one looks at the most recent climate change committee report i can well see a clash coming with government pretty soon about whether they're actually on track to meet their net zero commission um commitments um you know it's not for me to say when that's going to happen but i will be very interested i think on the the other the, the other aspect which i think is terribly important which james emphasized is the action in the civil courts using company law and that of course i think is may very well be happening pretty soon but i'd be very interested to know what james thinks about that in this country as opposed to uh, poland which is fascinating james would you like to weigh in quickly on this Sorry now. Yes, absolutely. So um I mean Robert's certainly right uh, about the legislative frameworks and if you cast back in your mind to much of uh, really all of the eight categories uh I was talking about earlier they all they all rely on some kind of legislative framework uh in order to to be effective. It's it's is the really the way to go. The Climate Change Act in the UK is a world leading statute. It could be better and uh, we're arguing that Uh, what it needs to have and which would make litigation also much easier is a hard carbon budget at the moment the climate change committee sets a target um the government is supposed to come up with a plan to meet it uh the obligation is slightly fuzzy and the government has admitted that the fourth carbon budget which is uh, uh in 2023 will not be met so uh there is an interesting potential for for litigation there Uh, and yes lots of potential company claims um in in the uk um from pen, uh, pension funds to banks to many so uh, i watch this space okay thank you james uh, i think we'll be coming back to some some more questions about uh possibilities of of going of litigating with and against companies uh in the, in the future but first joanna there's a there were a couple of technical questions that came up on your report that i thought uh might be interesting to to get your uh responses to I'll I'll give two. Uh first, does the Paris agreement uh explain the spike in cases after 2015 or would there be some other explanation that you might offer? Um and then second, there's a question about the central and peripheral categories uh for cases. Um the question comes in like this. 
regarding the idea of climate being central or peripheral, in a given case, this seems like a tricky line to draw. For example, a planning challenge to a particular mine may be motivated for clear climate reasons, but use existing planning frameworks and causes of action, which make no reference to climate. Can you speak a little more to the methodology used here and how that flows into broader issues with categorizing cases? Sure, so um, starting with the second one, um, of course, uh, it's, it's not a, an easy thing to do to classify a case according to A or B, central and peripheral. So uh, it, it's, it, and, and at the same time, I have to say, it being classified as one or the other doesn't mean the case is better or worse. It's, uh, it's a way for us to try to make sense of this uh, number of cases. And, uh, and in many situations, as you, the person asking the question pointed, it can be strategic not to make climate central to the case. So again, there's no judgment uh, in, in how this is done. What I think it's an interesting uh, thing to observe is that uh, climate litigation is more nuanced than just a word climate litigation. And of course, we're more exposed to some of the cases. And we, for example, uh, uh, we had this discussion before, Mike, and I, I feel like I just wanted to make sure that people don't think that every single case of these 1,500 is not an agenda case and that there's a, 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 a quite wide range. So uh, I can, uh, in the report, we explain how we do this classification and I'm happy to follow up with you, but it's basically uh, if, uh, for example, uh, air pollution or deforestation is at the core of the case and climate is uh, a peripheral issue, then this is how we classify. Um, to the second point on uh, the Paris Agreement, I think that's, that's a, also a, an interesting question in that, um, if you look at the graph, yeah, you see a spike in 2015. So that's where uh, qualitative research has to complement numbers because you, you, you see the spike and, and to understand uh, if it's random or if it makes any sense, you need to speak to people, for example, who brought the cases and organizations who are uh, filing cases to understand why they, they decided to file a case in 2015. Um, I, I would say from interviews that I already did and, and from other uh, scholars that there is a combination of climate being high on the agenda. So uh, 2015 is a year that followed the assessment report number four uh, of the IPCC. So science becomes clear, um, policymakers in, in, engage in this discourse. You have uh, then the Paris Agreement, which brought uh, this bottom up rather than top down approach, which again uh, puts maybe governments more in terms of the commitments that they are making and allow uh, litigants to consider whether that's sufficient or insufficient. So um, there is um, uh, definitely a, a component of uh, being higher in the agenda and, and, and motivating uh, cases, not only because there is insatisfaction, but also because you have more support from other people, more understanding of how important the issue is. Thank you, Joanna. Um, James, a question for you, um, and I, I, I will also note that obviously I think m multiple panelists could answer some of these questions, but uh, in the interest of, of fitting in as many questions as we can, I'm going to continue to try and tailor this a bit. Um, James, this is a question about shareholder litigation, uh, and you discussed your, your, your case in Poland. Um, but there's, there's a, I guess, a broader category of cases around uh, misleading statements, um, particularly about the long-term viability and value of fossil fuel investments in the context of climate risk. Uh, so this question asks about the experience of the case, the people of the state of New York versus ExxonMobil, which suggests that it will be hard to prove some kinds of, of disclosure cases. Um, can the risk of this type of litigation precipitate more accurate disclosure of transition risks? And are the write downs that we are now seeing from some oil majors linked to this risk? Mm. If such claims are viable, what sectors beyond oil and gas may also be vulnerable? And, and I, I wonder if on this point, you might care to discuss the, the OECD petition that client are brought uh, against BP in particular. Mm, sure. So um, yes, uh, I think that that case was a bit disappointing, uh, the New York case. Uh, and uh, even though you had the vast resources of the New York Attorney General's office, which are vast compared to uh, any 
uh, NGO. Um, and, um, you know, it, uh, it leads me to think uh, that, well, I should say that we have had some success bringing companies uh, in front of regulators saying uh, the companies were not disclosing accurately. I mean, we had some success with, uh, with BP and with Rio Tinto, and we have some complaints like that going on in the, in the UK. But uh, I think the um, uh, moving back to the uh, interplay between legislation and litigation, what would be extremely helpful here and what we and others uh, like Mark Carney are uh, arguing for is to make the um, disclosure requirements that are currently voluntary, the task force for climate related financial disclosure uh, led by Bloomberg and Carney came up with a very good set, um, could be even tougher, but a very good set of disclosures now voluntary, they really need to be made mandatory. Um, and there are a variety of ways to do that. I mean, one of the ways to do that that we're arguing for uh, is that for any country, and I, I wrote to the prime minister in the UK about this the other day, if any country gives a bailout to a company, uh, one of the things they should require um, is the adoption in a mandatory uh, way of the task force uh, uh, disclosure obligations. Um, and more broadly, that should be put in, in, in legislation, I think. Um, there, you would then be able to compel um, disclosure in a way that you can't really do now. Um, I'd, uh, you know, and um, that there, we could have a very long discussion about this, but you asked me to be short, so. Thank you, James. Um, and uh, thank you for tying it to the, in part, your, your response in part to some of the questions about bailouts uh, and the current recovery. Mm as we, had, we did get a number of questions that we may not get a chance to get to um, about strategies um, for incorporating climate into uh, the COVID recovery funding streams. Um, Irum, a question for you. Now, I was going to ask you about um, future generations. Is there always a question in the queue um, about precedent for uh, bringing claims on behalf of future generations, but you anticipated that question uh, and, and already responded to it. So um, there's another comment though that I think would be very interesting to get your uh, response to. This is not a question, but a comment. Uh, and I'm wondering if your work with the judiciaries in the, in the Asian region uh, and the research for the reports that you were discussing may, may provide some insights here. This is a comment from an attorney who um, has worked uh, on the tar coal power plant litigation in Pakistan. In countries like Pakistan, climate change is still seen as a foreign agenda to restrict development. And any petition, particularly against any project under CPEC, which I'm not quite sure what that is, um, is seen as an ill-motivated move. Uh, I'm wondering if you have a response to this, uh, this idea um, and this, and this reality that climate change is not viewed as a domestic priority um, in Pakistan uh, and in, in other countries in the region and how that factors into litigation. Uh, I think that's, that's a very uh, a valid comment and valid observation. And it's not just Pakistan centric, but many other uh, South Asian as well as Pacific countries that we work in. Unfortunately, these countries have so many issues that are brought to court, including the security issues, including the food issues, and there is not a nexus between climate change and these issues. And hence climate change and environmental issues or litigation is still seeing as fancy ideas against development. So judges who take action uh, pro environmental climate are seen as anti development judges. That was one reason why what motivated me to start working with the judges to provide them a group of like minded judges so they don't feel isolated or shunned out by their own um, uh, people and and uh, and uh, and their, their fellow colleagues who think that if you make a pro-environment decision, it will be anti-government decision. I think in the past, I would say there was some um, truth attached to it as well, because judges, as I said, were not very well informed. They did not have technical basis or rationale for their decision. So their decisions would be like, stop this factory, but then why, what the reason is, it's not well rationalized and justified a decision and hence was viewed as anti-development decision. But now judges are well informed, at least those who are well trained, well informed, they completely provide good rationale and they bring um, uh, information from other countries. So it's kind of the perspective this perspective is changing. That's why you're seeing so many interesting cases coming out of these countries. But yet, as a larger picture, because of the illiteracy rate, high illiteracy rate, lack of uh, connection being made between climate change, disasters, and issues, it's still seen as a fancy issue. But 
picture is much, much brighter than I would say five years ago. So yeah, valid comment, but with some uh, qualifications. James uh, is uh, wanting to. Could, could I just add something to that? Because I saw a related question from someone about, um, you know, if you're going to stop coal in Asia, um, you're depriving people of needed electricity. How can you possibly have a just society or just transition if you're going to stop coal? And it's an, similarly uh, to what Hiram was saying, it's, it's an incredibly valid and important question. And there are something like 300, last time I checked, 350 million people um, in Asia without electricity. And they obviously need it. So we have to be pro-development in this way. And uh, we have to make sure people get electricity, but that they get clean electricity. Uh, and uh, the great mistake would be to invest these hundreds of billions uh, in building coal, uh, which will become stranded assets uh, and take the money away from investment that will give people uh, future energy, clean clean and green energy. So, I mean, in my own perspective, as, I, as we work on stopping coal in Asia, we'll also, as in Europe, uh, work on energy markets to open, uh, open energy markets and make sure renewables actually uh, have a chance or get a better chance. Thank you. So I'm seeing a number of questions popping up around strategic litigation specific issues such as standing requirements in different jurisdictions, the role of science and how to incorporate science um, and what the standards of evidentiary proof are in different contexts. Uh, we have seven minutes left approximately to, to get through some questions. So I'm gonna leave some of those more particular questions um, aside for the moment and turn to a, a question that I think perhaps uh, everyone on the panel might have uh, a perspective to, to bring to bear on. Uh, and that's about the impact of, of climate litigation. Uh, the question comes in like this, if the plaintiffs win in the courtroom, do we have evidence that it does make a change? I have the impression that this is one of the gaps in the scholarship. How can we better assess the effectiveness of climate litigation in the future? Now, Joanna, you, you mentioned this in terms of um, uh, the, in regards to the report, and perhaps you could touch back on some of uh, your thinking around how uh, those sorts of studies might provide evidence. But I think, uh, Lord Carnwath and James, in a room, you could also bring your own experiences to bear uh, and, and perspectives on thinking about what kinds of impacts do we actually see coming out of the different types of climate litigation at stake here. So, Joanna, why don't we start with you uh, and then uh, hear from Lord Carn Carnwath, James, and Irum. Great. So I'll be brief. I think it's it's a, it's a very good question, one that I've been asking myself for a while, and I agree that the scholarship is still uh, hasn't provided much on this. Um, if if you look at other movements that use strategic litigation, for example, the human rights uh, movement, they've been using litigation for some time and have a number of ways to uh, and publications about uh, the impacts of that litigation. So my I think my, my first point is that uh, it, it is a new area and and that we need really more research and we can learn from human rights frameworks and assessments. Of course, they're not identical, but I think there's learning to be done from other types of strategic litigation movements. And, and then uh, we, we can also start seeing some specific impacts. And, and I think I, I mentioned already the direct application of the, the agenda decision, but I, I want now to maybe also make a point that in a number of these planning application cases dealing with planning applications where you, you basically are requiring uh, developers to, to be uh, clear about what their emissions are and to re require uh, re reductions in those emissions, we can see also how um, through courts you can have a direct impact in mitigation. And uh, so, so uh, that's the, kind of the, the more direct. And for the indirect, the range is wide. And uh, this is where you, you can see how litigation works together with other governance mechanisms, together with law, together with uh, advocacy, together with other types of mobilization. And what it is interesting is to try to separate somehow and also have this view uh, across time because there is the before the during and the after a case is brought and decided that needs to be considered so i pass it on to the others uh, but thank you for the question thank you lord carnwath be very interested to hear your perspective yes from i mean you know, yes, that. That's, put the finger on exactly what i was trying to say in my comments because 
you know, it's all very well to know that there's been a thousand plus cases in the United States. But what we want to know is what effect did they have and which had. And that was why I was looking when we know that, for example, the Massachusetts case was effective, but it was effective because Obama was able to make use of it. And one of the experiences of being a judge, which is very frustrating, is that one gives these great judgments, but one very rarely finds out how effective they were other than by chance. So I think one of the things I really would like us to be doing and thinking about hard over the next year up to COP26 is actually trying to analyze this data and trying to focus in on which of the sort of cases that really work and you know what the experience has. And I think James's comments on that are, are very, very important. But I think it's something that we can collectively really think about. And I'd like if we manage to organize some sort of conference next year to be that to be very much one of the focuses of it. Hmm. Yes, I, I agree. I, I think we all need to know more. I mean, I can, uh, and while working together on this is a terrific idea, I think, uh, across the globe. Um, and uh, I give you a couple of examples of why I, I do think it has impact. Uh, you know, um, I can assure Robert that his decision on air quality is having a, a big impact and that slow as it is, the UK government is actually doing something about air quality all over the country. And now 20 other countries in the EU are. And, you know, I gave the example that we, uh, We've seen the uh, the purchase of diesel vehicles in Germany fall twenty percent, um, which was which was a, a great thing to see, and the industry attributes it to this uh, to this litigation. Um, in the coal litigation, you know, we've seen Greece as and it says as a result of the litigation is going off coal, so uh, that's a big shift when the country says we're going to get off coal by twenty twenty eight. We saw um, in Poland. Um, that uh, just the other day, uh, the largest utility in Poland, and we've had several successive and successful suits against their coal-fired power stations over the last uh, 10 years, companies called PGE. They just announced that they are going to stop using coal. They're the biggest utility in Poland. It's almost 100% coal at the moment. Uh, and they said 2040, that's too late. We'll get them off that earlier. But again, that's a result of the litigation. So these are, uh, these are very good. Um, examples of what, what can work. As for our study, I would recommend also that we look at, uh, at China, because China is extremely interesting in this regard. I mean, we've been working there for seven years, and rather like Aram, we've been training judges uh, in, in China, um, and they now have 3,000 environment court judges in China. Astounding. Uh, and um, the prosecutors then came to us and asked us to train the prosecutors, because in a law that we worked on, uh, they got the right to sue the government for the first time. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the people uh, for the environment, and they hadn't had the right to sue the government before. So uh, they asked us to train them to sue the Chinese government, a remarkable question, uh, which we <laughs> were very grateful to be able to do, bringing in experts from around the world. Um, and in the two, in the four years, I guess, uh, uh, since uh, that program started, uh, the prosecutors tell us they've brought around 120,000, initiated 120,000 cases something like 70% against government entities. Now, uh, that's remarkable, you know, uh, and they say they're getting something like a 90% uh, settlement rate uh, with everything they demand. And uh, if, you know, I, I, we need to see more numbers about this, but this looks to me like the biggest example, um, that's what you would expect from China, the biggest example in anything, but uh, the, the biggest example of using litigation to rapidly change uh, not only pollution, uh, but then also company behavior, social behavior, and the norms uh, and introduce the rule of law uh, for, for the environment. So I think it behooves us as we ask about how litigation can be used to include this in our study. Your Honor, final word on, on impact. Yes, so impacts, uh, of course, the question is valid because the long-term impacts of climate, which will be, which will have to be seen and monitored over some longer period of time, which I think is a fantastic idea for the study to, to evaluate that. But we have, uh, in a lot of cases, seen a short-term impact as well, at least that short-term impact leading towards a longer-term climate uh, fixing impact. For instance, in the Lagari case, the famous that Lord Canvas talked about, and I thought I will not talk about, but uh, I end up doing that. 
what courts in few countries are doing because a judge is not a technical or scientific expert and cannot have that kind of an impact through a case they resort to um, uh, and in a few cases they started constituting expert panels that's what happened in the commission sorry in the in the lagari case where the judge said that i'm not an expert in the climate change in all scientific areas at all so he constituted a, a commission of experts uh, with members from government private sector public sector Uh, scientists engineers and he said uh, asked the commission to look into all areas of climate change in pakistan so they had sub commissions within that large commission recommend short term solutions and medium term solutions with the budget the commission came back with a comprehensive list of recommendations uh, with the budget he then called relevant ministries to the court saying that this is your responsibility this is the budget you need to come up with and implement start implementing these short term uh, recommendations immediately so within the case we started seeing the short term um, you know implementation impacts um, you know on various sectors but of course longer term we'll have to see so similar examples are there like chitwan national park a highway was stopped by the court now alternatives are being explored which is the right way of doing it there might there must be some parallel roads that can be developed and excluding that national heritage park so we see short term uh, impacts of the litigation which then tie up with the longer term impacts and that is why we call it a strategic litigation kind of you know impacting uh, straight away so yeah my two cents thank you very much arun um so that is all we have time for today there is many, there are many more questions in the queue but uh we'll just have to leave them there for now please join me in thanking our panelists for their remarkable focus on this event and engagement with uh the presentations and the, and the questions and all of your ongoing commitment to um taking on the climate challenge through the courts and otherwise and i'll turn it over now to robert faulkner to conclude Well thank you panelists thank you Michael for chairing this event I mean it's been tremendously inspiring to listen to this conversation despite the last question about what impact is this having I'm encouraged to hear that uh, climate litigation is spreading around the world that the, the number of successful cases is going up and and this gives me hope for as we enter next year and the delayed COP26 uh that will have to drive up ambition in climate policy in case you would like to have a look at the report that joanna uh, has produced that reviews global trends in climate litigation it's to be found on the grantham research institute website uh please have a look at that there's lots more information you can get there on climate le legislation and litigation um so please make use of that i repeat what i said at the beginning this event has been recorded so if if it goes well we will make a podcast available and please do tune in to future grantham research institute events we are planning many more events uh, later this summer and into the autumn and we will come back to discuss climate litigation as well but uh, thank you all thank you so much for joining in from around the world we had a tremendous turn in uh, hundreds of people from around the world who've joined in record number of q and a's and Uh goodbye bye